Welcome to ASRM Today, a podcast that takes a deeper dive into the current topics in reproductive medicine. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Hayes, your host for this episode of ASRM Today. On this episode, we are speaking with Elise Powell from the ASRM Office of Public Affairs about the 2020 state policy changes that ASRM has been instrumental in. Welcome, Elise. Thanks for having me on, Jeff. Again, my name is Elise Powell, and I'm from ASRM's Office of Public Affairs. I, together with others here in our DC headquarters, have the privilege of working alongside our partners in the field to propose and advance state policies to support family building and access to reproductive care. So today I'm here to share a couple of recent victories on the state level that have been some much needed good news in the midst of everything that's going on related to COVID-19. So I'll start with um, some great news coming out of Colorado. On April 1st, Governor Jared Polis signed the Colorado Building Families Act which will provide insurance coverage for infertility treatments, including IVF and fertility preservation, effective January 1, 2022. This new mandate is projected to affect about 1.2 million Coloradans. What was the extent of infertility coverage that existed prior to this new infertility mandate? So under the current law, infertility coverage only includes things like x-rays, diagnostic lab procedures related to infertility and coverage for IUI. And what is in this new infertility mandate? So the details of the bill include coverage of three completed egg retrievals, unlimited embryo transfers, and there's no requirement that all embryos be transferred before completing more retrievals. It also covers fertility preservation, including storage fees, which is really great. And it mandates that infertility be treated as any other disease, meaning no additional co-pays or co-insurance requirements. And it also includes coverage of all necessary medications to treat the disease. So this historic legislation makes Colorado the 18th state with an infertility insurance law, the 12th to provide IVF coverage, and the 10th state to provide fertility preservation for cancer patients and others whose medical treatment may cause iatrogenic infertility. To give a little bit of the behind the scenes, I'll share a bit about ASRM's role in getting this piece of legislation enacted. So ASRM worked in concert with the Colorado Fertility Advocates, which is a grassroots advocacy organization made up of doctors, ART attorneys, patient advocates, many of whom are Resolve members, um, and the Alliance for Fertility Preservation. So the Colorado Fertility Advocates and Resolve hosted a lobby day on February 6th that I attended to represent ASRM at the state capitol in Denver, along with 65 other attendees. And this was actually the first lobby day I attended on behalf of ASRM. Um, And it was really amazing to see how Colorado's state legislature worked in real time. On the day we were there, both the House and the Senate were still in session and actually on the floor voting for the first half of the day. So it was awesome to see them in action. We literally had to pull some of the members off the chamber floor during debates and discussion to have our meetings about the Colorado Mm -hmm. Building Families Act. I was grouped with some wonderful patient advocates who were able to share their stories and struggle with infertility and connect their personal experience to how their access to care would be improved if the Colorado Building Families Act were to be passed. And actually in a couple of the meetings I was present for, the lawmakers themselves, they shared a personal connection, either through a family member or a close friend who had gone through or been diagnosed with infertility themselves. Oh, okay. So I wanted to uh, make sure to give a quick shout out uh, to two ASRM members who testified before the House Health and Insurance Committee, um, Dr. Leslie Apaya and Dr. Sarah Barton. Thank you so much for giving your time to this important cause. It was really influential into getting this bill passed. To my knowledge, this was the one of the fastest moving infertility coverage bills that ASRM has worked on. From introduction to signing in one session's time is a really amazing feat. And moreover, the bill passed with strong bipartisan support in both the House and the Senate. So with all of that said, as is often the case, when a new law is enacted, there are a few yet unknowns. As of right now, the large group market, 
will be implementing coverage, as I said, on January 1st, 2022. And the small and individual markets will likely be on the same timeline. However, there are some ACA regulatory formalities that must be asked and answered by the Department of Health and Human Services, or HHS, mm-hmm. before an implementation date can be confirmed. Still, this remains something to look forward to in this time of crisis. And I just want to make sure I mention that in the governor's bill signing statement, he said, quote, this bill will help families have children in the wake of COVID-19 and is important for our state's future economic success, which I think is a really great way to summarize our efforts going forward. Next, I'd like to share a bit about our major win in New York State. On April 2nd, the New York legislature passed the state's annual budget, which included the Child Parent Security Act. And with its passage, it has overturned New York's longtime ban on gestational carrier contracts. Well, that's interesting. So now as we shift to New York, what were the laws on gestational surrogacy prior to the new 2020 law? Great question. So prior to this new law, New York, along with several other states, instituted its ban on gestational carrier agreements in the wake of the 1987 so-called Baby M case which, as most of you are likely familiar with, was the first time a court chimed in on the issue of parentage in relation to surrogacy agreements. So up until now, under New York law, paid surrogacy is punishable by a fine. And while surrogacy arrangements were not viewed as criminal, such agreements were not legally binding or enforceable. And while only New York and Michigan ban all forms of compensated gestational surrogacy, Most states do not have the kinds of protections for surrogates and intended parents that are included in the Child Parent Security Act. So by passing the Child Parent Security Act, or CPSA, New York joins 10 states and D.C. um, that have best practice laws legalizing and regulating compensated gestational surrogacy for intended parents, whether they are a married straight couple, a married gay couple, unmarried, or single, and whether they are biologically related to the child or not. Can you give, for those that don't know, can you give a little bit about this bill's background? Of course. So the Child Parent Security Act was sponsored by Senator Brad Hoyleman and Assemblywoman Amy Pollan, and it was intended to modernize New York law to support and protect individuals and couples that rely on ART to build a family. And thanks to Governor Cuomo, who included this measure in his 2020 budget proposal, the CPSA was passed on April 3rd as part of the state's annual budget. In addition to a ban on surrogacy contracts, New York surprisingly also had no laws addressing the legal parentage of children conceived through egg or embryo donation. Under these antiquated laws, sperm and egg donors could be granted rights or given responsibilities that aren't intended while intended parents and their children could be subjected to frightening uncertainty or forced into legal limbo. Also, non-biological parents could be subjected to an intrusive, expensive, and time-consuming second parent adoption process in order to secure legal parenthood in all instances. Hmm. So with all this then, what does this new law mean for patients and providers? So the new law at long last legalizes compensated gestational carrier contracts or arrangements in New Mm -hmm. York State and clarifies parentage for intended children from gestational carriers and from donor eggs, sperm, and embryo. Can, Can you give us some details of the new law? Sure. The Child Parent Security Act uh, ensures that intended parents who enlist the help of a third party to conceive their child have a secure legal relationship with their child from the moment of birth. It also ensures the legalization of compensated gestational surrogacy agreements, establishing the strongest protections for surrogates of any state in the country. It ensures a simplified process for securing parenthood for non-biological parents, including lesbian couples, and it ends legal uncertainty for single women who rely on sperm donor to build a family. The CPSA also includes a surrogate's bill of rights, which would ensure that women serving as surrogates have the right to make all health and welfare decisions regarding themselves and their pregnancy, including whether to terminate or continue the pregnancy. 
Um, it ensures that they have independent counsel uh, for their, of their choosing paid for by the intended parents and that they have access to comprehensive health insurance policies also paid for by the intended parents and access to counseling and life insurance. When then will it be legal? So New York will allow residents to enter into the paid gestational surrogacy contracts on or after February 15th of 2021, just under a year from now. Again, okay. I want to give a big shout out to uh, Dr. Richard Grazi, Dr. Samantha Pfeiffer, and Dr. Judy Stern, who were instrumental in making sure the physician perspective was heard on this matter. What have been some of uh, ASRM's defensive efforts? So in addition to our work to help get laws passed, we are also constantly keeping an eye out for bills um, with harmful consequences for our members and for those who suffer from infertility. For example, this session, we fought back and defeated a bad surrogacy bill in South Dakota, working with our partners at Quad A and with the support of our members who answered our call to action to contact their legislators. We successfully squashed a bill that would have banned surrogacy contracts, even after it had already been cleared um, by the House. So as a result of that, we are now enlisted to weigh in during the next phase of bill drafting, and hopefully we'll get some good protections going forward. Also in Florida, we worked closely with our partners in the field to raise uh, to lawmakers, including the bill's author and sponsor, concerns and opportunities to strengthen a reproductive health bill. Thanks to our efforts, the bill is now something that we can support, and it will now address issues including fertility fraud, reproductive battery, and patient consent for pelvic exams. Is there anything about abortion restrictions? Yes. So I also wanted to mention that in this current environment, I, we think that it is appalling that the anti-abortion policymakers across the country and in Congress are using a pandemic to extend their efforts to shut down abortion access. At a time when people's reproductive health care needs will likely increase, ASRM is doing everything we can to fight back against these restrictions. Among other things, we're joining ACOG and other reproductive rights and health groups on amicus briefs in Texas, Oklahoma, Alabama, and Ohio. And lastly, I wanted to mention that Resolve and ASRM have transformed our annual advocacy day from a live event to a virtual event, and it's still happening on May 20th, 2020. Your participation in Advocacy Day is needed now more than ever. Please join us to tell your story and those of your patients to help us advance federal legislation to address infertility. I've been speaking today with uh, Elise Powell from the ASRM Office of Public Affairs about the 2020 state policy changes that ASRM has been instrumental in Elise, thank you so much for taking time out to, uh, to be with us today and to keep us informed. Thanks for having me, Jeff.